Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to session three that is referred to as diverse workforce in cybersecurity. My name is Remy Ayoko, and I'm one of the associate professors at the uh, UQ Business School. I'm also a discipline management discipline leader. Uh, I serve in a few other different roles, but it's my pleasure to be here this afternoon to talk about workforce diversity in cybersecurity, because that happens to be one of the topics that actually energizes me and motivates me all the time. My research is in the area of diverse work Force. I have a few other things that I do, but this is, I'm very passionate about this one as well. And today um, we have abled panelists that are going to help us through tackling some issues around diverse workforce in cybersecurity. And I know that many of you understand that diverse workforce is, um, it incorporates all kinds of diversity indices. So when we talk about diverse workforce, we're not just talking about gender alone, we're talking about disability, we're talking about sexual orientation, we're talking about ethnicity, race, we're talking about all facets of diversity. But today we are going to focus on gender in particular. And so the panelists that we have will be focusing their attention on gender per se. So um, I have prepared a couple of slides that will introduce the questions that I will be asking them. And uh, I'll just uh, prepare to go through uh, those slides systematically. Now, um, I want to thank, before I get into that, I want to thank uh, Professor Ryan Koo and uh, Jana Kana Smith uh, for inviting me to do this. I do really appreciate that. Okay. Um, my slides are not Tony. Somebody does the slides for me. It's not coming through. I did. Okay. Uh, I know that Kana has acknowledged uh, the country, and I'm so grateful that she's done that. But usually we do this in UQ, and I think everywhere in Australia will do this these days. So I like to acknowledge the country. I acknowledge the Yagara people. Um, Just give me a second. Yes, I acknowledge the Yagara people and the Toba peoples as traditional owners and they are custodian of the lands uh, on which we actually stand today. And I pay my respect to their ancestors and uh, future generation to come. So thank you for that. I just need to go into this. Today we have two able panelists that are going to be talking about their experiences today. And one of them is uh, Ms. Kana Shinoda. Uh, she is the founder of Blue Ink. And then we have another person, abled experience in her own right, Ms. Amy Roberts. She's the Assistant Director, Diversity and Inclusion Directorate, and also from the Australian Signals Directorate. Just a quick reminder that this event that we have this afternoon is DFAT Australia Japan event. Now, um, I have a first question, which is what, when they asked me to do this today, the first thing that came to my head was, oh my God, what's this that cybersecurity all about? I know I have um, a staff member in my discipline who teaches into cybersecurity leadership, but really, <laughs> every time I hear cybersecurity, I'm going, oh, hackers are here and they're trying to help me to uh, protect my computer, protect my data. So what's this cybersecurity? And before I go into this first question, I have one question that, I, that is bothering me all this time. And I just want to ask that question and maybe Professor Ryan Koo will be able to ask, answer that question for us. And this is, what is the difference between cybersecurity as a concept and cybersecurity as a profession? Thank you. Cyber security as a phenomenon, as a concept, and cyber security as a profession. Thank you. Yes, sorry for crashing into the session. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, uh, maybe I'll just keep it very short. I think cyber security as a concept is mainly about the addressing uh, of preventing and stopping threats in the cyber physical realms. So the interaction of devices and computers 
with the humans and the teams of humans. So it's all about removing the threats, preventing the threats. Now to do that, uh, it's, not just, it's not just a technical threat. So hence we need the profession, which are able to cover beyond the technical areas, such as management, leadership, criminology, geopolitical considerations. That's a huge variety of jobs because one single human can't do everything. So we have the profession, which is in so many flavors. And I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. You, you, uh, you made my day today because uh, in my head, I was thinking, what's, what's this uh, phenomenon called cybersecurity and how is it connected with um, cybersecurity as a profession? And so thank you so much for clearing that um, confusion that anybody could have around those two areas. Now, my first question goes to Amy. Amy, how are you? Hi, Remy, pleased to talk to you. Well, how are you? Thank you very much. Uh, my question, my first question goes to you today. And this question is in your own words, please in a nutshell, can you describe what you personally understand by the term cybersecurity? Thanks, Remy. And I um, um, would like to say I'm honored to be here today and I'm joining everybody from Narrago land, which is near the Southeastern New South Wales, near the capital of Australia in Canberra and also um, extend a big hello to uh, my, my co-panelist, Kana, from Japan. Welcome. Um, so exactly as Ryan said, the practice of cybersecurity is the protection against unauthorised access um, yeah, to data of other computerised systems from hackers wishing to steal information. So it covers everything from our mobile devices and our internet connected devices in the home to business information and personally identifiable customer data to the infrastructure of major services such as cloud and telecommunication providers. Yep. electricity suppliers, hospitals, and manufacturing industry. So whilst it seems like the threats are all around and it's personal and we're being attacked, it's not personal. Um, most is just for financial gain. And many scams that you receive on your mobile phone or your email, for example, are actually generated by you know, supercomputers hoping to catch somebody out by clicking on a fake link. And that's why it's called phishing, because they're literally you know, phishing for people. So that's, in a nutshell, my understanding of cybersecurity. Thank you very much. It's not too far away from what Professor Kuhl told us a while ago. So uh, there's a lot of overlap and similarity between uh, what you understand as a concept and what he understands as a concept of uh, cybersecurity. So thank you for that. And in terms of profession, the two of you, uh, Kana uh, Shinoda and Amy Roberts, the two of you are the epitome of cybersecurity profession. This is why you're on the panel today. And so a lot of the questions that I will be asking you will be unpacking these issues around cybersecurity as a profession. So let's go to the next question. So the next question is first to Jana, uh, Kana, um, how are you involved in the cybersecurity profession and which organizations do you actually work for? Kana. Uh, voice. You're muted, Kana. I forgot I'm mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, Kana, <laughs> we can't hear you. Yes. yes. Um, uh, would you I like will, to check, uh, Kana? This is the interview style, Kana. and then I prefer to speak in Japanese. So please forgive me. My uh, translation is a little bit late. Okay. Now, I'm going to speak in え、サイバーセキュリティの仕事にどのように関わってきたかですが、私自身は株式会社ブルーの代表をしておりますで、え、コードブルーというものを2010、え、4年2月に第1回を開催して、今、9回開催しております国際会議ですね、情報セキュリ
そこで、えー、CTF の国際大会をするんですがアジア代表チームを作らなければいけなかったのでやはりアジア8カ国共同で、えー、ACSC というアジア大会を作りアジア代表選手を来年の6月ギリシャに送り出します。えー、こういったようにあの私はサイバーセキュリティにおける国際連携を担っております。Extraordinary. Thank you for that. And、uh, thank you to the translator. It amazes me every now and again when people speak in two languages or three languages. And、uh, when Kana、uh, Smith was talking, I felt like just jumping into her mouth, like, oh, she just switched from English to Japan. And a lot of you will be very familiar with the surname that I just. Put out to you a while ago is called A Y O K O Ayoko. However,、uh, it has some connections with the Japanese language. And a lot of people say to me,、uh, Do you know what your name means in Japan and Japanese language? I don't want any more. And so I go, Yes,、uh, that's okay, but I want more.、Uh, give me more. And so I'm so grateful that you can speak in a language that is very comfortable for you. And we all understand what the、um, Translator has said, so thank you.、Uh, this question I would like、um, Amy to take a stab.、Um, how are you involved in cybersecurity, Amy? And which organization do you really work for? Thanks, Remy. So I work for the Australian Signals Directorate, which is the federal government agency responsible for foreign intelligence gathering. And I'm in one of the rare public facing roles of our organization and in the national intelligence community. So, I lead the Women in Cyber Program for Government, which is an external facing program designed to increase the presence of women in the Australian cybersecurity industry. And it involves getting out into the community, sponsoring events and activities, and keeping abreast of what's happening on the ground and outside of the bubble of government so that we can prepare policy and prepare programs and deliver content that's、uh, meaningful and relevant to the industry and what it needs at the moment. Thank you very much. Obviously, you've been doing a lot of work, and I'll be asking you a few questions that will help you to narrate your journey all the way through from the beginning to where you are right now. But it suffices to say now that、um, you've been pretty much involved, you are involved in many programs. We would explore that as we move further in, these,、uh, in this session today. So let's go to the third question.、Um, and this third question is asking for.、Um, For you to tell us your, a, a little story about how you got to where you are now. Obviously, everything starts from some humble beginning. And now we are asking you to trace that humble beginning to where you are right now in a snapshot. So, can I ask Amy to start?、Um, tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you get to where you are right now? Tell us about your obstacles, for example, your challenges. As an individual person in this、uh, profession.、Uh, tell us the supporting resources you got along the way. You got mentoring, you got coaches,、uh, people who are able to coach you in, in, in this. Did you get sponsorship? What resources did you get to help you navigate it onto where you are now? So I'd like Amy to start this short, sweet narrative. Thank you. Sure. So, I've been in the cybersecurity industry for 10 years, and I came in from a project management and administration background. And,、um, and like a lot of people in our industry, it hasn't been a direct path from school to studying at university to entering into a cybersecurity role. My role is a culmination of many years of experience of working with people and managing projects, writing policy, identifying you know, gaps in the market, and you know, delivering programs to be able to address those gaps. I got involved in looking at the lack of、um, diversity in cybersecurity about eight years ago. And there was a you know, conversation starting that we need more diversity in the industry so that we're actually able to build products and write policy that is representative of the community that we're aiming to serve. So I've been in government for, you know, in, that, in that role for a long time.、Um, I have been involved with、um, mentoring people as well as I've received mentoring myself. And I have, you know, the challenges that I've faced have, you know, been walking into a room as a woman in, you know, to a, a conference or a meeting with, you know,、um, a very、uh, male dominated environment and, you know, everything ranging from not being listened to and taking, not being taken seriously,、um, you, you know, right down to, you know, being assumed that I'll be the minute taker and go and get the coffee. So 
there are, you know, many challenges in our industry. And I've been very, very fortunate that I have had great um, sponsors in my mentors that, you know, I've had people who have actually invited me along to be involved in projects that they're involved in and have given me access to, to people who have helped me to move through my career and to learn as I've, as I've gone along. But I think the thing to note, just going back to, you know, um, what is cybersecurity, the professions within cybersecurity, like mine, are wide and varied. And whilst, you know, there are professionals responsible for protecting IT infrastructure and devices, there's also people that need, you know, all of the, the qualities of um, uh, inquisitiveness and the ability to puzzle, problem solve and a, a thirst for learning to continue to keep up to date with what's going on in the industry. And I think that's one of the greatest things that I've had the opportunity to do is to continue to learn and um that, you know, threats are evolving all the time in cybersecurity. Therefore, we need people that can keep up with, you know, um, all of the, the policies and the, the challenges and, and whatnot around the whole industry. So, you know, my greatest um, benefit has been my networks, and I'm a member of the Australian Women in Security Network. If people are interested in joining, it's awsn.org.au. And that's, you know, there's three to 4,000 members across Australia, all interested in furthering the aims of women insecurity and through that network that's where you can find mentors and people to assist okay thank you very much thank you very much for unpacking that journey for us as briefly as possible from what you told us now it seems to me that really you can jump into cyber security from any background is that correct yeah absolutely so you could be doing one thing and then you suddenly take an interest in cybersecurity and you just uh, find a way of connecting that profession. Or you could be a mother uh, who had taken some time out of uh, real work or whatever uh, work you have been doing before and you've gone to nurse your baby and now you want to go back. Maybe then cybersecurity is another option for you that you can click in and join in at that particular time. Is that, is that am I correct to say that? Yeah, absolutely. So all of the skills, for example, you know, of um, lawyers or finance specialists or you know, risk and governance professionals, policymakers and educators are all skills that are absolutely relevant to the cybersecurity industry. People with different languages, you know, we need people to be able to interpret and analyse data as it's coming through from foreign um, sources. So all of those skills are actually transferable to a cybersecurity environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just as I was preparing for this particular session, I read a couple of uh, papers around cybersecurity and workforce diversity. And one of the things that I gathered from there is that it's not just about technical skills, it's also about interpersonal skills. So that corroborates what uh, Amy has just been telling us. It's not just about IT, technical, technological skills, or just knowing how to walk through your computer platforms. It's also about interpersonal skills as well and leadership skills as we do have that in the course we mount at the UQ Business School on cybersecurity and leadership. So thank you for that. I'm now going to give Kana Shinoda an opportunity to tell us a little bit about her journey. How did you come in? It's an extraordinary fit. How did you come to build a whole blue incorporation? How did you get involved? How did you do this? Hi. Eh, to, I was, ma, to university. 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 So, you know, Nihon Goto, Egoto, Computer Science, Gawakaru Kara, to Yuri Desta. And Hotondo no, Sonokoro no, a computer no Joho, ma security no Joho to Yuno, a Obekin, Ego Ken Kara Kurumono Gawakata no de, so you mean what I see assigned Saremasta. De Soko de Zombuni, a Ken Kumo Shi, Katsu, a system administration mo Shimasta. Nado de Atarashi Kizai Moso desga, a Trouble Shooto, Nado mo, Kaken Sasete Tadakimasta. で、え、その後新規事業開発、ま、あの、ベンチャー開発、投資系の企業に入りまして、ネオテニーというんですが、え、そこでえ、ビジネスのことも学びました。特にゼロを1にする部分ですね、を学びました。で、え、そこでもあ
の、えー、イベントマネジメントを依頼されます。で、えーっとまあ、ブラックハットジャパンのマネジメントがあのハッカーコミュニティの、えー、そうですね、創立とか設立とかのきっかけになっています。で、えー、ブラックハットジャパンを、えー、っと立ち上げて、えー、その時にやはりコンピューターサイエンスのバックグラウンド、ハッカー、えーハッカーコミュニティのバックグラウンドかつ新規事業開発のバックグラウンドが役立ってゼロを一にすることができたと思います。で、えー、ブラックハットジャパンでは大変に苦労しましたが、えー、2008年リーマンショックで終わったので、えー、その数年後になんとかみ,なみんなの協力を得てコードブルーを立ち上げるに至ります。コードブルーを立ち上げるために株式会社ブルーを立ち上げました。で、えー、障害についてですが、実は私自身、障害があまり記憶にないんですね。あの、運が良かったと思うしかないんですけれど、あの、悪いことを忘れてしまう癖がありまして、障害はあまり記憶にないんです。ただ、あの、いろんな周りの方にあの教えていただき、導いていただいたと思っています。で、あの、すべてトライアンドエラーで学んできた記憶です。ただ、一番大きな自分の中での、えーなんて言うんでしょうね。ラックオブコンフィデンス。自信、女性特有の自信のなさ。自分に自分にバイアスをかけてた部分が一つあって、それがコードブルー立ち上げの時ですね。えー、コードブルーはハッカーカンファレンスなのであの、ファウンダーは男性であるべきという先入観がすごくありました。ファウンダーが男性のハッカーでマグネットになるべきだと思っていたので、そういうマグネットになるべき男性を探していました。で、でも、最後の最後に、君ほど、えー、かなさんほど情熱を持っている人は他にいないじゃないかと。情熱を持っている人がファウンダーになるべきだ。男性、女性関係ないと、男性の友人に言われたんです。もし立ち上げたら応援するよと。いうことで、その言葉を胸に、あの、皆さんの協力を得て立ち上げるに至りました。だから、私の中の、えー、バリアをそこで破ることができたし、そのバリアが、えー、そうですね。一番の障壁だったかもしれません。私が記憶する。Thank you very much,、uh, Kana. It's interesting when we talk about biases and stereotypes and prejudices. We always think that、uh, other people have those things about us. But from what she has said today, it's, it's also about taking in those prejudices and biases and internalizing them. So basically, what she's talking about is that she, people would say, Oh, you're a woman. You are not going to be the magnet that we are looking for in order to start this company. But we know that now we can take the mask off, and that, that, that's not true. That you can be a magnet as a woman. But the, the thing that I really want to talk about here is the fact that sometimes we internalize those prejudices, the stereotypes, and, and, and、uh, biases that are there. And we think, well, this is going to stop us from doing what we need to do. Now we can hear from Kana that those biases and stereotypes should never be internalized, should never affect our confidence. In doing what we need to do, we are the women, are the magnets that this particular profession is looking for. And if we want to diversify、uh, people who get into this profession, we have to take that、uh, lack of confidence off. We have to stop internalizing prejudices, biases, and stereotypes around gender or around any diversity indices for that matter. So,、uh, thank you for that. And I think your response actually takes us straight away, it's highly connected. With the next question that I have. What are the barriers for women to enter the cybersecurity profession? What barriers do they have?、Um, we know that diversity already evokes all kinds of biases, stereotypes, and prejudices. Come on. Sometimes, as soon as you see them, those、um, uh, biases and stereotypes just come on and it gets onto unconscious biases. People don't even know that they are working with their unconscious bias. Uh, uh, two or three days ago, someone said to me, Well, it's not about unconscious biases, r e m y it's actually conscious biases. This is because、um, people did this a while ago and they perpetuated it. And because they perpetuated it, it's no longer unconscious. It is actually conscious bias. I'm like,、ah, I need to do some research around that because in literature, we have always had about unconscious bias and we forgive it because it is unconscious. Now, my eyes are open and like, oh, 
is no longer unconscious bias, it's conscious bias. And people refuse to break it. Um, they keep doing this, they don't care how it feels on the other side, and they keep doing it. So today we want to navigate. What is it that are the barriers for women to enter cybersecurity as a profession, regardless of those stereotypes, biases, and prejudices? Amy, would you like to start for us? Thanks, Remy. I think that I, I do agree with, with um, Kana in regards to the, the confidences and you know, needing to shrug off um, that feeling of not belonging and, and wanting to you know, charge on in and, and be involved in an organisation. But in the 10 years that I've been running programs, you know, establishing a women in cyber mentoring program and doing um, public speaking, coaching, technical training and supporting you know, girls and their teachers and career counsellors, the figures of participation haven't really increased that much. But no matter how much confidence training we actually provide, no matter how much um, mentoring we provide, it's not women that need fixing, in my opinion. We have a systemic problem. And that systemic problem, um, you know, it, it struck me some time ago that we we actually need to look at the culture of the industry that we're in. And some of the um, barriers to women entering the industry are still, you know, pay disparity, a lack of flexible working arrangements and realistic work-life balance. And, and these can all impact on the tenure or the choices that women make when they're looking at a career option. I also believe that we still have issues of educating young girls and teachers and their parents around the options available in STEM-related careers, particularly in cybersecurity and ICT, because it starts at a very young age, that bias development, and you know, Kana works with young people, so she would know this more than anyone. There are messages in society all the way through growing up that girls belong in one camp and boys belong in another camp, very generally. There are, of course, some incredibly supportive groups that work with students to break those biases, but I think that's where it begins, is you know the barriers begin right back the way there. If girls are lucky enough to engage in STEM subjects through primary school, then often during the teenage years, that's when you know society also tells them that it's not cool to be involved in, in cyber. So I, I believe that it's the responsibility of all of us to continue to remind everybody in society that they belong in this industry and that we do need that diverse array of um, not just gender differences, but as you spoke about earlier, there's abilities, race, um, age, uh, location. The diversity of thought is what actually gives us, you know, a high level of national security and building good products and writing good policy. Thank you very much. I, I like your line. It's not women that need fixing. It's the system that actually needs fixing. It's the system that we need to fix. It's yeah. all of us that need to fix something. Uh, it starts from when we have a boy and a girl, baby girls, baby, baby girl, baby boy. You give, what kind of gift do you give to a baby girl? Come on now. What kind of gifts would you give to a woman who has just had a baby girl? Come on. <laughs> what kind of gifts? Thank you. A pink doll, a pink dress, a pink shoe, a pair of shoes. And the boys, blue. And when they are two years old, what kind of toys do you give to them? Ah, thank you. So you give them Lego. The women, the girls can't do Lego. Okay. And so you give them strong um, uh, trucks so they can hit the wall with it. The girls, you give them, oh yeah, what can you give them dolls? Yeah, so already as a community, we already distinguishing between a girl and a boy. Uh, Unconscious bias? Conscious bias? Maybe. Because we keep doing it and we're all guilty of that. And that's how we begin to segregate women and men into who they could be, how far they can go, which particular profession they can get into. It starts from birth. So if we have to do something according to what Amy is saying to us about, uh, we have to start from you know, erasing that unconscious bias or conscious bias about what kind of gift and how we treat the girls as different from the boys and not penalize the girls for trying to be like a boy. We call them tomboys. Um, we already have those words there and they don't go well with where the women can go in the nearest future. But before we go any further, Kana, do you have anything to add to this? Mm, 
あのバリアとなっているのはやっぱりラックオブコンフィデンスがまず一つあるんだろうと思います。サイバーセキュリティにおいてですね。はい。うん、えー、やっぱり男性が多い、えー、グループに入ることに躊躇するのはあの国に限らず日本に限らずアメリカでも聞きますし、うん、フランスでも聞きますしあの多くのところで聞かれます。で、あの特にあのラックオブコンフィデンスをまあや要はそうですね。一つ例を挙げますと、CTF4G という CTF をプレイする女性の集まりを、まあ、があるんですね。それを作ったんです。で、その第1回に参加したときによく分かったことがあります。第1回なのに80名を超える女性が集まったんです。しかも多様な分野から。で、サイバーセキュリティのスタディグループを、あの、呼びかけたときに、大抵男性しか集まらないんですが、女性の集まりだと言ったときに、第一回に80名以上が集まるんですよ。で、そこで集まって、真摯に学んで、笑顔で談笑する姿があったんですね。で、その笑顔を見たときに、あ、あの、これが真実なんだなと、あの、思いました。だから、躊躇する女性がやっぱり隠れているっていうのは、その時に、あの、理解しました。で、あのそういう安心できるあのそういう隠れた女性が安心できる世界の中でトライアンドエラー自分が失敗しても笑われない場所安心できる場所でスキルを上げていくことは大切なあのなんじゃないかなと思います。Okay, thank you very much for that. And now I go to my last question for the session, especially for the panelists. How can we, and just building on from all the questions we have had today and all the responses to these questions, how can we increase women's involvement in cybersecurity in the next five years?、Uh, in business school, we talk about strategic goals. We talk about short strategic goals. We talk about long strategic goals. So if there were strategic goals in how we can improve the number of people or women who get into cybersecurity, a short goal, five years' time, what are we going to be doing? What strategic goals do we have? What should change in our policies, for example? What education or programs should we have? What events? And how is this connected with AI? Because we all talk about AI, artificial intelligence now. They are coming, they are coming, they're going to get our jobs.、Uh, we all cry out that way. So now, how is this connected with AI? So if I can ask you,、um, Amy, to start this for us, what would you like to see? In this area, in this profession, especially for women wanting to join the profession in both Australia and next, I will go to Canada in Japan. How can we increase the rate of women that are trying to get into cybersecurity? Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Remy. I think that, like anything, it starts with awareness and awareness of the career opportunities available in cybersecurity.、Yeah. And I think that awareness comes across a lot of different levels. It's, Ensuring that,、uh, as I said earlier, teachers and parents are aware of the careers that are available. So that's incumbent upon the industry and government to raise that awareness, work with the education sector, and make sure there's consistent messaging of the types of careers that are available so that they're attractive to everybody. The、uh, programs that government run, for example, we address、uh, student activities. So we、um, support organizations like the Girls Programming Network, which is For girls to learn how to code from the ages of 10 through to 17, and they run through selected universities around Australia. I think then supporting high school competition so that that interest is maintained throughout you know, the early teen and later teen years.、Yeah. And then I think it's important for universities across all faculties and、um, other further education、uh, organisations to make sure that. The lecturers and the heads of the departments are aware of the roles that are available as well. So that means keeping up to date with what's happening within the industry. And that's where partnering with government, partnering with education sectors, partnering with not for profits is absolutely critical. And joint events like this is fantastic because we can all learn from one another. The sorts of programs that government run do have a strategic intent that we want to see,、um, you know, for example, Women nurtured coming out of university in the early stages of their career and being offered a mentoring program, which will hopefully translate into roles with partner organisations in the industry. There's an acceptance that industry will then accept and move staff in between government and the、um, you know, 
tertiary sector and the private sector. Yeah. And then we look at then offering technical training to women in further, you know, later years of their career. So we're looking at that whole gamut of ages and stages and then attracting women, as you said, returning to the workforce or wanting to pivot mid-career. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kana, in the Japan context, how can we increase women's involvement in cybersecurity as a profession in the next five years? あの、いう流れになっているので、この中高生のステム教育を補強することで、コンピューターサイエンスの厚みが広くなり、おのずとサイバーセキュリティのあの女性のエンターも多くなってくると。なので、あの一つはボスを増やすことだと思っています。で、もう一
Um, I can speak from my experience of what our organisation is doing at the moment to address, which I think, you know, if government leads, it's a great example. So very simple measures that can be put in place, which are limited cost, is that our senior executive have stopped um, senior meetings outside of the hours of 9.30 to 3.30, for example, to allow for parents, both parents to be able to, or all parents, to be able to arrange drop-offs and pick-ups, so making it a little bit more family friendly. We're also looking at um, shared parental arrangements, shared parental leave, so that um, both parents have access to parental leave. And this has the added benefit of, you know, if the primary carer, the person that, you know, is mainly looking after the child, if they have an opportunity to re-enter the workforce and their partner has equal access to have time off with the child, it gives both opportunities. Um, and it sets a really good example in the organisation that parenting is a valued part of, um, you know, our employees and that they're still contributing even if they're only there three and a half days a week. So I think that's, you know, measures that can be taken. All of our employees are also required to um, undertake mandatory awareness training on workplace behaviour, which includes bias training. We also have um, gender and other diversity uh, training. Our organisation has diversity networks where people can come together and be involved with like-minded people to come up with ideas and activities in the workplace to make you feel as though you belong, but also to further the aims of, of that group within the workplace. Um, and we also have access to you know, clinical psychologists. So a lot of organisations have access to employee assistance programs so that if you need to seek help, you can't go to your, your superiors, there is that help available. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that was an interesting question, a very good question. Um, yeah, it's very, it's very important that we keep interrogating that particular question around, um, is, it a, is it a playing field? even when you build your career, is it a playing field for both women and men? You lose five days having your menstrual period, for example. Sometimes I get really cranky with Olympians um, and I worry if when they were doing their races, some of them were actually undergoing <laughs> their period at that point in time. It already, already sets them in a very different plane already. Um, and so we have to interrogate this. I have two boys and one girl uh, as my own children and my girl recently said to me, how can this be right? If I'm not able to work for two or three days because of a biological reason and I'm expected to compete in a very competing, uh, competitive environment with other men who don't have that same issue, how can this be right? But I agree with you, Amy, uh, that we've come a long way. When I had my kids a while ago, they are young adults. There was no paternity leave. There was no maternity, you know, was maternity leave, but you couldn't get one whole year out to look after your baby. So the system has improved. We have to keep talking about it. We have mm. to keep the debate on. We have to keep on interrogating this until uh, we have almost equal field for both men and women. Would there be any other question on the floor? Comments? Thank you, Professor Remy. Um, yes, uh, my name is Mary. I um, studied uh, cybersecurity, studied this year at UQ. Professor Ryan is one of my lecturers. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it's uh, a big change for me, especially now I finished my first state, uh, the graduate certificate in cybersecurity and I'm starting to go back to work. So I'm a mom. So I'm a returning, returning mom, so not like a first graduate. So um, during my study, like the last semester, the last few months, I started to look for a job. So um, it's not a small company that I apply for. I got it from some of my good friends, big companies across Australia. And um, the challenge is still there. So we're talking about gender diversity. It's not just gender. Sometimes it's a situation that I have, maybe I'm a, a mom. So I have someone next to me, behind me. And then I tick all the box when I apply for a job. And then um, in cybersecurity, I think it's a very unique industry workforce. And then it's very new. 
And some of the uh, challenges that I face is from the employer side. So they don't seem to um, understand what is actually cybersecurity. So we're not talking about female or male, but I'm emphasizing about uh, my skill. So I'm trying to get a job in the cybersecurity field, but at this stage, I go through a few good interview. The last, the last one it was like took me two hours. So I was confident enough. To like, okay, I pretty much get the job. I got it from my classmate, from UQ classmate. And then he's one of he he is one of the directors. Oh, why don't you just try here? I said, oh, okay, that's great, because he's been in the same course with me for the last year. Okay, and then it took me like about two hours. So only on the interview, excluding the travel that I live in Gokus. And I was so confident. And a week after the interview, I got a phone call. Oh, Mary, thank you so much for your time. You have an awesome experience. Your resume is amazing, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, he said, no, I'm just like, why? And I know why you said so nicely that I tick all the box. Um, you because you don't have a software engineer background, but you're not looking for engineer software engineer background. You're looking for a sales. So what's the um? Mm. Mm. Yeah. So this probably um behind the scene decision that I don't know. It could be gender. It could be age. So diversity is not only gender. So it's it means a lot of things. So we don't know, I don't know, I question them. So the answer is just, oh, you don't have a Soviet engineer. Yeah, I'm not looking for Soviet engineer. The application is sales, just pure sales. Yeah, I'm sorry that decision that I made. Okay, and then, <laughs> that, that, that's not the only thing that, that come across my, um, my mind because I've been, joining a lot of workshop like this, a lot of online webinar, Zoom, et cetera. And then they keep saying that, oh, we lack of cybersecurity expert. We don't have enough people. And I said like, no, you don't. Yes, you have enough people. You just don't <laughs> open your door. Right. We are standing in front of the door of cybersecurity industry. And then inside you say, you don't have people in there. If you just open your door for entry level, you see us, millions of us raising to get the job. Yeah. You're muted, Remy. Yeah, thank you. So I was just saying, I was just saying that the experience uh, Maria, Mary has just shared is very relevant to the, the conversation today. And it just shows us that those stereotypes and biases are still very much alive. And we still continue to have to do something about those things so that we can have plenty of your type to get into the profession that you really really you're excited to get into thank you so hi thank you for your uh, talks here today that's been really interesting my name is marie and i work in the school of it and electrical engineering and which is a very male dominant dominated world of course and i'm trying hard uh, to actually get more female students coming into our programs kana so that's nice to know because you said we need to broaden the basis here but uh, what I'm interested in hearing from you two today is what recommendations would you be giving to our male co-workers here? Because they often come and say to me, so how can we help? And I know we can't give them a whole lecture now, but what would be your top recommendations here? How do you think our male colleagues can actually support and help us? Because it is a tough environment sometimes. And I'm sure they don't want to talk about periods, but um, what, how can they help uh, in our daily um, meetings and etc. Thank you very much. Would there be first anyone in the audience who would like to respond to that quickly? 
And I have to say that we don't, people, people are shy to talk about periods, but I think the time is ripe for us to open it up. There is nothing to be shy about that. We should be confident to open it up. This is what happens to women. It's a biological process. I didn't ask for it. I got given. I got assigned to it. So we have to keep interrogating it and we have to keep talking about it. So Amy, yes. would you like to respond to that? What suggestions do you have for our no. male colleagues to yes. help bring more people or even help them once they are in into this profession? Sure. And I think it addresses both. Thank you, Mary and Maria, for your, your questions. I think that a couple of things come immediately to mind. So one of the things that I was at a conference the other day and a woman stood up and said, I challenge everybody in the next 12 months to just make an effort to assist two women with mentoring and then shadowing opportunities in the workplace. So if you do have somebody in the workplace, don't assume that just because you've said, oh, well, you can come and apply for this if you're interested, that that person is actually going to, you know, to take the opportunity. So there's a saying that, um, you know, a mentor of mine used to use, open a door and invite a woman in, but then actually help her to sit at the table once she crosses the threshold. So actually sponsoring somebody and actively engaging in their career development and believing in them and trusting in their skills is absolutely critical. In terms of getting people into the organisation with what Maria was talking about, you know, if you're, if you're saying it's a sales role, but they come back and tell you it's, it's engineering. My first point is there are a lot of organisations that just aren't going to be for you. And if that's raised a red flag, then you don't want to be working for them. And there's, you can't educate everybody, as we know. However, I think that it's upon organisations to start to take a punt on unskilled and educated people to actually bring them in and, and recognise it might take 12 months to get them to the point where they're skilled, but that 12 month investment will be an investment that will not, you know, that will be a fabulous investment for the organisation. So in answer to your question, um, uh, the second question was that, you know, Take, take a punt on somebody that doesn't necessarily have all of the experience or all of the skills or necessarily all of the education that you're after. Because if someone's got curiosity, they've got aptitude, they've got empathy, and they're passionate, you can teach the skills. Yeah. You can put anybody through a 12-week boot camp to get them up to speed with basic coding and cyber skills. You can put somebody through, you know, a three-year scholarship of, of education. That investment, financial and resource and time. Oh, we lost that. Okay, um, we lost her a little bit. Um, I completely agree with what she has said. And I just wanna say that in management, when we talk about inclusion, one of the things that we talk about is getting women to shadow the men in the bigger job. You get people, women to shadow them. What does that mean? Uh, you give them an opportunity to act on that role for three months. So basically they debunk all the uh, stereotypes around that particular role. Oh, I can't do it. I don't think I have confidence to do it. Well, when you give them opportunity to come into that role for three months, you debunk all the myth around that particular role. So that's another way in which our male colleagues can help women in that particular role to, in, in, who are very curious to, to get into the profession. That's one way in which you can, you can kind of help them to grow. All right. Sorry. One, question from the audience. One more question from the audience. Oh, okay, so in the chat. <laughs> okay, thank you. What's what? Which one was this? Pauline, we hand the mic to you in the net. Where's Pauline? Hello, I'm here. Uh, okay. Uh, so you are on webinar. Online. Online. So can you please ask your question? I'm just looking at the time. We have four minutes to go. <laughs> So please ask your question. We would attend to it as quickly as possible. Thank you. Okay. I was very pleased to hear about the issue of age. Australia, uh, by the way, I'm a lawyer and I work with cybersecurity and cybercrime. I've published over 10,000 pages in the field and I retired, but I'm still out working on two books. Um, and I've observed uh, being the only woman at meetings for many years, Ryan and I received the same award from ISC squared, but I am uh, put out to pasture and furious. We, what, I, what I want to say is this, I think law 
and compliance have to be part of the picture, unfortunately. And Australia has law with respect to age discrimination and gender discrimination and is very advanced. I don't know if Australia applies the law very much. So my question is, do, do they insist on compliance? And can people go forward and say, I'm 50 years old, I've been a division head in a multinational, and all of a sudden they've, um, they've canceled my job, basically. I heard this from a woman at RSA in Singapore, um, and she had to start her own business. So is Australia enforcing its law? And is Japan contemplating using its equal opportunity law in a more um, active way to improve things in, in cybersecurity and IT fields, STEM fields? Thank you very much, Pauline. I think these are questions that are on the mind of everybody in this room and also online. Do we really enforce our, do we police our rules and regulations and legislations really? I know that a lot of organizations claim to be uh, work diversity friendly organizations, but only superficially. Um, right. When you get into it, really, uh, there is nothing to show for it. So I'm about um, getting away from policies and getting into actions really and policing those legislations that you are talking about. If they will be heavily penalized, then they will do something about it. But it's not just doing something about it for the sake of it. Uh, there is a business case for diversity. There is an ethical case for diversity. For the sake of ethics, we need to kind of improve uh, inclusion in every sphere of any organization at all. So these questions are valid and we can continue beyond this session today to continue to talk about this, to continue to ask questions, to continue to seek answers to these questions. I'm looking at the time and we have just one minute to go. And I just want to use this opportunity to say thank you to our panelists, um, Amy Roberts, Kana Shinoda, thank you so much for your contributions today. Um, if you are a mother, in this uh, setting today or anywhere in this setting, and you are thinking of sending your daughter to do cybersecurity, get into cybersecurity as a profession, and you have more questions than we have been able to attend to today, please send all your requests to Kana Smith at cyber at uq.edu.au. You can also talk to Amy, Amy, Amy Roberts at defense.gov.au. Um, Kana Shinoda is also there. You have all her address on this screen. And if you have particular questions around diversity inclusion, what is a leader, uh, leadership that kind of include other people? What's inclusive leadership? What does that mean? Uh, talk to me. I'm at the UK Business School and we would connect collectively, answer all your questions. Once again, thank you for giving me this privilege. I thank you all and see you sometime. Thank you.